Well, good snowy Thursday morning for some. I'm Jeff Nally, and we are here at our Farm Credit Illinois headquarters in Muhammad, Illinois. Uh, the trees glistening as we came in this morning from the snow and the ice that was an overnight last night. Varied amounts of snow uh, across the state of Illinois. For myself, I came up from the south, and in some areas, just not much at all. But in one 20-mile stretch, I noted yesterday, uh, coming north to Champaign, I counted 14 different vehicles uh, that were off the road in two 18-wheelers. It got slick in a hurry. Uh, in some areas, but as we got close to Champaign and up here in the Mojave area, not a big deal. A, a lot of times, and of course, Eric Snodgrass will talk about that. He's our guest this morning. A lot of times when you push the, the, the snow off of the parking lot, you've got those big piles of snow. And I guess for boredom and offices, sometimes people start up, uh, you know, a random guess of how long does it take for the snow to melt? Uh, this morning, the piles of ice melt are bigger than the snow, but, you know, it only takes a little bit of ice to throw things off. All right, we want to uh, begin our, uh, our program this morning, and I'd like to share, and you can read along there on the screen. If you've got audio issues, then you need to refer to the registration email, and there's phone number there. You're also going to need the access and the PIN number from it, so if you have any issues, refer to that and use that phone number. Uh, here's another one. Your microphone is going to be muted upon joining, so make sure that your speakers are on so you can hear the presentation. Uh, we are not doing webcams on everybody watching. That may disappoint some, that may please others, but nonetheless, the only ones you see are those panelists that are involved in our program this morning. Uh, when we come down to the end of Eric's presentation and during his presentation, if you've got a question that you'd like to ask, then go over to the questions tab It'll be over on the uh, right-hand side of your screen, and if you'll expand that, then you'll be able to type your question in there. We'll see it, and then we'll be able to, uh, to offer that. We also have a one-page handouts that's available on the handouts tab, also there on the right side of the screen. Uh, if you are eligible for a learning incentive, then you'll receive an email following the meeting. Uh, all the attendee uh, names will be recorded at the end of the program. So if you thought you might be able to sneak in and sign up and then take off, uh, we're going to take names at the end of the program. Uh, those that indicate they need a voucher will receive one from an email. Uh, be sure that you check your spam and junk folder. Uh, that can certainly get in the way of some of the business. Uh, a, a lot of uh, monumental changes taking place in our industry, not only from the marketplace, predicated by demand, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but also predicated by weather. Last week, we had a, a great meeting with Steve Johnson uh, as a part of our first Fielding Ford meeting. This week, again, Eric Snodgrass with Newton Ag Solutions. We'll talk about that. Be sure next week, this sounds like a TV show where we're uh, promoing ahead, but we are. Uh, next week, we'll have Matt Bennett with agmarket.net and also Steve Johnson as panelists on the program, but also some of our specialists on crop insurance. Uh, so next week will be a lively discussion and we will uh, we'll be talking shop. And, and at the rate that which news is affecting this marketplace, I would not anticipate that the uh, landscape is going to be the same next week as it is today. Uh, certainly this has been a, uh, an event that has been on the move. Uh, not anything more important, uh, I think, when we look at what farm policy has been, what farm policy is now, are those risk protection programs. And as Washington is talking about climate change and climate policy, most farm groups say that's fine, but we need the risk management tools. And now is the time, obviously, as you're planning on 21, to be thinking about risk management and crop insurance. And we have a video for you as we begin our program this morning. Thank you. I learned that crop insurance was very important to our farming operation uh, back when I was a youngster and my dad was farming and he thought he could save some money over the years by not having crop insurance and, and he lost um, about 39 and a half acres out of a 40 acre wheat field to a hailstorm right prior to wheat harvest. 
Crop Insurance provides you a baseline guarantee based on the history of your farm operation. Also provides you peace of mind if you're going to have any issues with weather. But at the end of the day, what it's doing is it's just making you be able to plan for the future. We experienced a hailstorm in early July out here and uh, it was a fairly significant loss. After the devastation was over, we of course inspected the farms ourselves. It was disheartening to see what had happened, but you know, we got on the phone, called our adjuster and it was a relief to talk to them on the phone knowing that we had the coverage we had. I strongly feel it is important to also take supplementary coverages such as hail or replant options with your baseline MPCI coverage. Hail insurance is extremely important for instance if you get farms that some of them get hit and some don't. Your federal crop may or may not cover you in that situation depending on what the other farms made so it's important for hail to give you that coverage. And hail provides other things such as fire wow. coverage, lightning coverage, transit. Wow. So there's a lot of things that, for not very much money, that give you a lot of peace of mind above and beyond your baseline policy. This hailstorm was probably the worst event I've ever experienced in, in my 47 years of farming. The settlement that came out of, of the, the hail adjustment was more than fair. It would have been a disaster if we had not have had crop hail insurance. I really enjoy my job a lot. You really are a consultant to your farmer. You want your customer to be successful. And to be that way, you need to know their farm well and you need to know what they need. We've been very comfortable working with Lee. He's become part of our operation and we can rely on him. There's no smoke, there's no mirrors. The education that we receive from Lee and the, and the network at Farm Credit has become very important to us. And it's added to our operation and it's enhanced our operation. And again, our thanks for Farm Credit Illinois for presenting the Stealing Forward meetings on the day today. Uh, so much has changed in our business. I uh, recall back uh, not so many years ago when uh, dad and granddad would tell me that, you know, you could afford out of so many years to have a loss here and there, but but not anymore. And, and, and what would you say at the end of a devastation or at the end of a disaster? What could I have done to avoid this? Well, you can't do anything to control Mother Nature. You can't do anything to control the circumstances that you're in but you can do something about managing the risk in the midst of it. And I think that's the place that we certainly are today. Uh, we are working on some technical issues here. And in the meantime that that's going on, I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes here sharing with you a little bit of news. Uh, I'm looking at the Chicago Board of Trade this morning and corn futures right now are mixed. Our front months are steady to a fraction higher. That's the March and the May. But the uh, new crop months for corn uh, between a penny and a half and two and three quarter cents a bushel up. And I find that interesting because we are finding the Chinese have made another purchase of 1.7 million metric tons of corn. This is coming on top of the 1.3 million that they bought last week. Last week was a record. Here's another record, but the market's not showing a lot of reaction to it. And as Eric Snodgrass will join us here in just a few minutes, we're in a parallel in the market that I would suggest, and we'll probably talk more about this next week, but you've got the bullish factor of global demand, not just for corn and of soy, but also a tremendous demand for corn and for soy uh, domestically. But you have the weather event that we're talking about this morning, uh, what's happening in the Southern Hemisphere. And while they have been extremely dry and they have had problems with drought, they also are getting moisture right now. Insult and injury for those who have suffered through a dusty year. Now it's time to harvest what's there and it's raining, but that's also benefiting those late planted crops. So you have a push and pull going in the market now, A from demand. And then the second side of the equation uh, is, is that going on with what promises to be a tremendous amount of competition coming from our competitors to the south. Some other pieces of news that we would share with you this morning. We're keeping an eye, uh, obviously, on Washington. Uh, yesterday, our president, uh, Joe Biden, signing an executive order uh, that they say will help to restore the balance on public lands and waters. The executive action focus on climate change directs the Interior Department to outline steps to achieve the president's commitment to conserving at least 30% of lands and waters by the year 2030. 
Interior will undertake the process, and it'll also spill over just a bit. Now this, uh, the leaders of the Senate, Mr. Schumer and Mr. McConnell, have not signed the the uh, 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 organizing resolution, if you will, for the U.S. Senate. They haven't done that yet, um, but they will. And when they do, then Debbie Stabenow of Michigan will become the chairwoman of the Senate Agriculture Committee. Until that happens, they have a hard time confirming uh, our nominee to be Secretary of Agriculture, which is Tom Vilsack. Well, Ms. Uh, Stabenow is going to be talking to media a bit later on, and they have gone ahead and scheduled the hearing from the Agriculture Committee uh, with Mr. Vilsack for next Tuesday. So considering that executive order, now this, uh, the Secretary will be keeping busy uh, with the executive order. He has to gather input from farmers, foresters, and others on how best to use USDA programs and to encourage voluntary adoption of climate smart agricultural and forestry practices. So this makes me wonder what are the things that are coming? Obviously, USDA can't write new laws. And Mr. Grassley said he didn't want this secretary to start changing the stream of the 2018 Farm Bill. He can only implement the policy that's in place. So how may things be amended that would follow along with the president's executive order? That's an issue we need to watch. We also have to keep an eye on Washington and see what policy may be coming down the pike. Does climate change, uh, does it wait for the new farm bill or does the climate change situation begin to take form now and they start to amend some programs? I would suggest there's a tremendous amount of difference in what could be a carbon bank from the Department of Agriculture to award farmers for farming practices that are that are precision and that are climate smart as we have here in Illinois. And then the contrast to that of the Green New Deal. And there are plenty of folks who want both and on either side of the equation in DC. All right, the USDA uh, has suggested yesterday they're going to halt debt collection on farm loans for a period of time uh, because of COVID. Uh, you'll hear more about this in this climate debate. Greenhouse gas emissions for corn are 46% lower than gasoline, according to a new study that was released by the ethanol industry. And that's going to come in really handy as we start to talk about climate ag. Growth Energy had shared with us that the previous study was 39%. Now we're up to 46%. We'll share this when uh, our uh, presenter comes in this morning, but I'd like to share something with you about our neighbors in Iowa. Here's some of the latest uh, research from Iowa State University's Iowa Farm and Rural Life Poll. Uh, in Iowa, at least, farmers have moved significantly in their view about climate change. Last year, 81% of farmers believe that climate change is occurring, up from 68% in 2011, that according to the study. By comparison, only 67% in the general public in Iowa believes that the climate is changing. And after they have experienced drought and flood and then last year's derecho event, you'd have to believe that some of these things taking place, uh, obviously helping them to see that things are just not like they used to be. Uh, I'm excited for our presenter this morning. Eric Snodgrass is the principal atmospheric scientist for Nutrient Ag Solutions. He develops predictive analytical software solutions to manage weather risk for global production agriculture. And as much as I respect Eric, no, he doesn't control weather, but he does provide <laughs> frequent weather updates that focus on high impact weather events influencing global agriculture productivity. There's a lot of other nice things that are here in Eric's bio, and I know he's listening to, him, uh, to me now. Uh, Eric was the director of under graduate studies of the, of the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Illinois uh, from 2006 to 2018. Uh, but in terms of our national media today and those who are involved in the industry, I don't know a person who works harder to provide information that is valuable and useful. Uh, Eric, over almost 40 years in this business, I've talked to a lot of people and sometimes their opinion of themselves uh, uh, is a lot uh, <laughs> greater, should you say, uh, than the information they provide. Uh, 
folks, if you don't know Eric, then I would suggest this is a guy who is more concerned about doing the job and seeing the job done right than probably anyone I've ever met in the industry. A tremendous amount of respect for this young man. I'm excited for what he's done, more excited for the things that he's going to do in his career and service to this industry and the country. Without further delay, ladies and gentlemen, our presenter this morning is Eric Snodgrass. Hello, neighbor. Hey, it is so good to, to, to hear your voice and to know you're just down the road from me right now, Jeff. And I uh, I apologize for all the hiccups there with, with what was going on. Get my presentation started. I can't get my webcam working. But you know what? I'm, I'm just going to tell you. Uh, COVID, I gained 10 pounds and a beard. So I don't look very good. I don't need you to see me. I'll just take a look at the weather here. And I uh, have a good time this morning talking about how weather is going to be impacting, as you see over there, production ag across the state of Illinois. Uh, and, and you're right. I mean, just listen to the video, hearing you speak, Jeff, you know, 2020 hit us a different way than 2019 did. And uh, thinking about that, I want to talk about it. We'll talk about those high impact events like the hail event, but also the derecho. show. We'll talk about flash drought, but I'm also going to talk about some long term trends. And then we are certainly going to look at South America. So I got a lot that I want to share with you, but I got a theme today. And uh, over the winter uh, uh, time period during, during the holidays, I reread one of my uh, favorite books, and I don't know if any of you have read this one, but it's a good one here. It was a book written by Timothy Egan, and it's about the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. It's called The Worst Hard Time. And what I love about this book is it tells the stories of the people of the drought of the 1930s, and it talks about what changed because of this particular event. And that's something I'm very interested in. So this is a good map. When you look at this map, you, you see this kind of, I don't know, is it like a lighter shade of green or yellow that's here across this part of Europe and Russia? Or if you come over here to the United States, you see it really well here uh, through the Midwest, up in the Canadian Prairie. That, that is farmland across the world. We grow food, fiber, and fuel, right? Now, as an atmospheric scientist that studies ag meteorology, I'm really interested how this map looked like this, specifically how it got to look like that across the United States. And if I take you back to that time period in the book, the late 1800s to the early 1900s, remember, this was a time where much of our policy was dominated by the Homestead Act, which was move west and we'll give you 108 or 160 acres. You just got to farm it, pay taxes, and, and, and we'll be good to go. We purchased the Louisiana Territory, the Texas annexation happened, and then we rushed for gold to the western part of the United States. Now, the United States government was quoted, and that's the quote in the upper left-hand corner here, they were quoted during this time period to have said that the soils of the Midwest, of the plains, that they were inexhaustible and indestructible. Just get out there and plow it up and plant, plant wheat and, and go and, and grow those crops. And we know what happened in the 1930s. Now, what was unique was from the late 1800s when we spread West, until the 1930s, we did have drought, but usually those droughts were one year long or maybe a two year long drought. But the 1930s arrived and we discovered that in combination with a series of weather events and very poor land management practices, we set the center part of the United States up for disaster. And you can see here the biggest problem. It was common thought that if you wanted to conserve your soil, plow it as often as you can. It was like recreational plowing for everybody anytime you didn't have a crop in the ground. And then the common thought of the time was, if you have got excess rain and you need to store it, so go out there and plow, turn that soil over. What we weren't understanding was that every single time we did this, we were destroying the soil structure and integrity and tilth. And as a result, during the drought of the 1930s, the combination of this human-induced disaster with our agricultural practices and the atmospheric-induced disaster with a stretch of very dry years, the dust just got blowing. Now, it was called the Dust Bowl. Now, this is interesting. Jeff, I hope you like this. Uh, I have heard so many different ways that people have tried to explain to me why the Dust Bowl was called the Dust Bowl. And I'm going to tell you why it was. It is not because you had to dust the bowls every time you ate because people did have to do that, but that's not how it got its name. It wasn't because when you were in one of these dust storms that it was so someone threw a bowl of dust in your face. No, no, no. It was a reporter, Jeff. All right. So it was somebody in the media 
who when writing about the black blizzard in April of 1935, just called the mid part of the United States, the dust bowl, referring to it as an area. Now, I'd like to talk to you about dust storms. I think this is kind of cool. This picture clearly not from the 1930s, but it's a modern day dust storm. And the vast majority of the dust storms that we get now are actually not of the same variety they were back in the 1930s. You see, across the United States, these types of dust storms called haboobs are much more uh, frequent than the dust storms of the past. Now, I know the name haboob is, is a good one to laugh at. And I tell you what, I have an eight-year-old son and I explained to him what a haboob was and he still can't get over it, but this is what it actually is. A thunderstorm, high base. See the ground here at the bottom of the storm there? High base thunderstorms only happen because the air underneath them is dry. They still produce that precipitation, but it evaporates. We call that verga. So the downdraft still hits the ground, but there's no rain in it. And when the downdraft hits the ground, it just exhausts outward. And if you'd like to see this, I'm going to take you to Memphis to show it to you. Now, a storm is brewing right in the middle of this animation, and I hope it's playing fast for all of you so you can see it. You see that ring that's radiating out from the center? That's the outflow of the thunderstorm. It's breathing, and it's letting that air out, as you see there. Now, if the soil underneath is dry and dusty, that outflow kicks up the dust, and it looks something like this. Can you see on each of these images that there's a storm sitting on top of the dust storm? Now, this is one way by which you can get this. And there's one of my favorite pictures here from Phoenix back in 2012. Now, the Dust Bowl of the 1930s gave us this type of dust. This was a, what we call a synoptic scale dust storm. Widespread winds that ran the length of the prairie and the plains and kicked up dust not from thunderstorms, but instead just in these massive plumes that carried across the country. And here's some of the most iconic images from the era. And I'm, I'm glad that these are creative commons and released to the public because I wanted to show you this one. Pampa, Texas, April 14th, 1935. And this is the Southern edge of what was called Black Sunday. This dust storm stretched from here clear into the Dakotas and moved across the United States. And as it did so, here's a picture of a dust storm earlier uh, from the previous year in South Dakota. But these walls of dust, as they advanced at 30, 40, 50, 60 miles an hour, did so and covered everything. At one point, one of these black blizzards was reported to have picked up 50 million acres of dust from the central plains of the United States. But here's the story I want to share with you. From the dust, arose a giant in soil conservation. And I hope somebody on the call today knows of Hugh Bennett. Hugh Bennett was practicing, practicing sustainability in soil conservation before it was cool to practice sustainability in soil conservation. He learned from his father and his grandfather how to take care of the land so that the land could take care of you. And so that he could farm, his son could farm, his grandson could farm, and they could continue to do this forever. What he learned was that some of the practices that were in common place were no good, the way we were overplowing the land. And he rose up to research this and began to spread the word all over the country about what his results were sharing. He had audience with individual farmers. He also talked to farm viewers. He talked to state. He talked to legislators. He talked all the way to the US Congress about his research. And one of my favorite quotes from Hugh Bennett is on page 227 of that book I started off with here. He said, when the people along the eastern seaboard began to taste fresh soil from the plains 2,000 miles away, many of them realized for the first time that somewhere something had gone wrong with the land. Now, what's he referring to here? You see, the people on the east coast were ignoring the complaints from the plains because we were in the middle of the Great Depression. They were, according to the, a lot of folks, bigger fish to fry. But we were destroying the land in the midsection of the United States, and the atmosphere was helping us out. And Hugh Bennett had a solution. And he got an audience with Congress five days after Black Sunday. So it was April 19th, and I love this story. You ready? Hugh Bennett, big guy, standing in front of Congress, testifying, and he is a man after my own heart. What he was doing was he was showing him charts and graphs and statistics. He's a giant data nerd, and I like data nerds, and he's just telling everybody what he knows and how he learned it. And what he was telling folks is, these are the practices that have to change in order to start doing better job with soil conservation, and I need money to do it. The senators that were listening to this guy could care less. In fact, most of them fell asleep in the middle of his presentation. I hope you're all awake still right now, but they were falling asleep during this guy's talk. 
because they didn't care. They had, according to them, bigger fish to fry. Now, in the middle of his speech, and this is the best part of the story, okay? One of his aides, Hugh Bennett's aides, tugged on his pant leg and said, Hugh, I just got a report that coming out of Kansas, coming out of Oklahoma. It came across the Mid-South, cut through Southern Illinois. It went through the Ohio River Valley. It's over the Appalachian Mountains. And they think that within an hour, one of our dusties, one of our big dust storms is gonna hit Washington, D.C. He said, can you stall? Now, Hugh Bennett, also being a great orator, to do what we could all do. Jeff, you're good at this, right? Stall, tell stories, make make a story. And he did this and he went <laughs> after that what, one hour time slot. And he did this so that as soon as the sky started to get gray, not gray, but coppery hue outside, he was gonna be shouting at these sleeping senators. And they woke up and they walked to the windows and what they saw outside was the sky getting darker and darker as one of these big dust storms came over. Now, if you've never seen one, I'm gonna show you a video of what it's like to get into one of these dust storms here. And I want you to imagine those senators walking over to the window, seeing something they'd never seen before. It was the dust from the planes. And as the dust got thicker, it blotted out the sky. And as it got darker, those senators started to realize something was not right. And what I absolutely love about the story is that Hugh Bennett in just nearly perfect Timing. I mean, there's some serendipity in here, if I've ever heard of any. He walks up behind those senators, and none of them are looking at him. And he looks at the backs of their heads and decides in a big voice to say, this gentleman is what I'm talking about. There goes Oklahoma. And they got darker and darker and darker. And those senators turned their heads around and looked at Hugh Bennett. And you know what happened? The very next day, they started the Soil Conservation Service, which is now NRCS. Now that's pretty cool. I've had this happen to me one time in my entire life. I was in Oklahoma, excuse me, I was in Omaha and I was given a seminar on tornadoes. And we had one right after my talk. You know what? I've been invited back every time to teach those guys about tornadoes because of that. But this is what happens when weather events coincide with some really cool science. Now, why do I tell you about this today? What's the point in sharing this story here at the beginning? We just recently had a big one. I'm gonna rewind the clock back to January 15th. That was that big cycle that went right through the midsection of the United States. But do you see this? On the backside, if you zoom in there, coming out of Colorado into Kansas, the panhandles of Oklahoma and Texas, well, let me show it to you on animation here. That's a dust storm, not the kind that comes from thunderstorms. That is because of the drought that's in the high plains. And that dust made it all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, stretched over a thousand miles. And this is the kind of stuff we were seeing all the time back in the 1930s. Now, to put a point to this, I wanna show what it's like to be in a modern day dust storm here. Nora Ferris got this, and I put this in my weather reports back on the 15th and 16th of this month, just to show you what it was like. But when we went back and we researched what happened during the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, I need this point to resonate with you. Okay, we saw cool water here. See it? Ship reports were analyzed and learned that there was quite a bit of cold water out here in the Pacific and it was quite warm in the Atlantic. Now, this is what helped the atmosphere get dry. We then helped it the rest of the way with our poor soil conservation practices. And you know why I go back and study history like this? Is because ultimately history is your best teacher, isn't it? What you got here is a map I've shown you all many, many times, county level corn production. The darker the green, the more productive the county is. What I wanna know is, how does this map change? You see, from 1980 to 2020, excuse me, I put a map together that shows you year on year variance with yield. Now, when you look at this, the closer you are to these colors, the blue colors, that's low variance, which means consistent. Where we have our most consistent yields is right here. And the reason why, we irrigate that crop. Don't forget that, that's an irrigated crop. Same thing, same thing for the West. You get down South, get the lower Mississippi River Valley or get down here in the Southeast, very high variability. Same thing for the Northern Plains. But here's the sweet spot right in through there where we have, we don't have much irrigated acreage, but we've got a lot of, a lot of rain normally. And year on year, our yields are doing just fine. But we need to think about what controls that variability. So let me give you some statistics. You know, Jeff, you were talking about issues with climate change. 
sometimes there's a, an interesting connotation we carry with climate change that follows our politics. Allow me to be just a nerd, a data nerd, and share with you what actually climate change means. It's right here in the statistics. Primary corn and soybean belt. Since our records began back in 1895, we have been getting wetter and wetter and wetter during our growing season at the expense of the West getting drier. It's statistically significant and it's considerable. We still have drought though. This is just looking at a time series for the Midwest. Drought still shows up in the middle of our summers, but now our drought is almost always a flash drought situation. Some of the key factors, take away these lessons with me, okay? You gotta watch the high plains. You gotta watch the four corner states for drought to spread east. We also need to watch the southeast too. I'll make that point in just a few moments. But just know that where we live, drought rarely lasts more than about nine months. The Corn Belt, it is most susceptible now to flash drought scenarios rather than persistent long-term drought. You could argue that 88 and 2012 were just prolonged flash drought scenarios. They only lasted during our primary growing season were wiped out after that. Now thinking about that, I need you to remember a little bit of Meteorology 101 here. Can you just take home with you this one idea? If we are gonna have great yielding years, we tend to have over British Columbia, right there, a big ridge. Now I hate to say this because of how much I care for our farmers in the Western part of this country, but if they're baking and they're burning, we are not. And the gesture tends to run right over a big ridge there and then dive into a trough over the Great Lakes. And these blue colors here, that's not rain, that's not cold. That is just routine weather systems moving through. And therefore we don't get stuck in one way or the other and we tend to have our best yielding years. Now, there's a correlation. The correlation, the R value is about 0 0.35. It's not high, but the warmer you make the water temperatures here, the better the chances are that we're not gonna have heat and drought where I put the X. Now let's look at the flip side of this. Our lowest yielding years, the years with drought, just think Minnesota, Wisconsin, right there, put a big ridge. Now, to be honest, if you vacation up in northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, you're going to love it when this happens because it'll be hot. Those lakes will be warm. You'll be able to swim. It'll be beautiful. But your crops in Illinois are going to be suffering. Over British Columbia, we're going to put over here a trough. And the jet stream is going to do this. It's going to get stuck. And therefore, we're not going to get the return of moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. And it kills our storms. Now, that same correlation coefficient where the R value is now about 0.32, you see here the cooler water. And I'm gonna put an X right there because over that spot, the correlation with our summer heat goes all the way up to 0.6. In fact, it's a negative 0.6, but still the value is 0.6. And therefore, when you listen to me speak for the rest of this morning, this is gonna be an area I wanna watch carefully over the coming weeks and months. I'll show you the latest forecast in a few minutes, but we gotta watch that very carefully. Now, what happened this year? Well, this year I'm calling the tail of two ridges. This particular map shows you based on climate reporting districts who had the wettest and who had the driest year this year. So for 2020, any place has got the number one in, it was wet, 129 was dry. What we're gonna talk about is what happened in the Southeast with hurricanes, massive drought in the West and flash drought right here in the midsection of the United States. All three of those topics, ready? Here we go. Let's talk West first. Here's ridge number one. We call the flow around it just like this. We call that ring of fire. So in other words, the flow goes around it in a ring and we get two types of fire. Fire from dry thunderstorms, which comes from lightning, that kind of fire, and then actual physical fire burning the western part of the United States. All the storms ran over the ridge like this and came into the Dakotas, Minnesota, parts of Iowa, including that big one that came down here in August. I'll tell you about that in a few moments. Now, because of that, the west burned 8.2 million acres. That's a record. And in the satellite animation from Labor Day weekend, you can see the extent of the smoke across the western part of the United States. I hope the animation is playing fast enough for you to see it here. It was incredible. I want to take you to a fire in Colorado because you actually saw this one in Illinois, believe it or not. The smoke from the Cameron Peak fire went across Colorado, Kansas, Missouri, came across the southern half of Illinois on its way to the North Atlantic. We didn't see it billowing like this. We saw the haze deep in the sky giving us brilliantly red sunsets. From there, speaking of red, look at San Francisco. This was midday, San Francisco, Labor Day weekend. The smoke blew out of the east and covered the city. 
the street lamps came on because of how thick the smoke was in the upper atmosphere. Absolutely unreal event. And if you want to see what it looks like to get the ash raining out of the sky, well, this is what it looked like on Aaron's windscreen here on the right and a piece she picked up from the sidewalk there on the left. The west was on fire. But that was ridge number one. Here's ridge number two. Around this ridge, the flow came in like this. And what it did was help guide hurricane after hurricane after hurricane into the southeastern part of the United States. We flew into every one of them, setting a record for the number of reconnaissance flights. Every squiggly line you see on this figure is a different hurricane that we flew into. Hurricane Laura was one of the worst ones. Louisiana got hit three times, and the moisture from Laura, Jeff, got all the way up to your territory over there in Kentucky. And this particular hurricane, when it slammed into Louisiana, was nasty, and it destroyed the radar that was in Lake Charles. Now, normally, there on this pedestal, there's a big dome that goes around a big 30-foot wide dish. That's what our radars look like. But this radar got hit with 130 mile an hour wind and ripped it off the pedestal. They just finished rebuilding it last week. It cost $1.65 million. A whole new radar system would have been $30 million. So they were able to repair it a lot cheaper than it was to buy a new one. But this is what it looked like right as the radar was destroyed. Lake Charles is here. There's the eye of the hurricane. I'll put an E in it for eye. And as it came over, well, it got hit with 138 mile an hour winds, but about a thousand feet above the ground, those winds were approaching 170 miles an hour. Mid-season is mid-September. And by mid-September, we had Sally, Paulette, Renee, Teddy, and Vicky. And if you notice, that's the end of the alphabet. We had already almost completely exhausted our name list before we even finished the month of September. And the contingency is to go into the Greek alphabet. And when you go into the Greek alphabet, well, this year we made it clear to Iota, but this was one of my favorites, Epsilon. You're on board the Hurricane Hunter, and you're about to fly through the eye wall of Hurricane Epsilon out in the open Atlantic at 10,000 feet. And what the pilot's doing here, and I hope that video is playing smoothly for you, we're flying right to the center of this hurricane where we're going to drop an instrument pack that we'll get the data from and be able to better forecast exactly where this hurricane is going to go. Now, here's something I'm proud of. In the United States, knock on wood, but we have never lost an aircraft flying into hurricanes. And these folks do it all the time. Now, when you put it all together, though, take a look at this. Why was the South and Southeast so wet? We had 12 separate systems that either 10 of them, which hit the United States, and two of them, which brushed by. And you can see here that Delta, Zeta, and Eta were the last ones that came through. Iota, which hit Honduras, was one of the most powerful tropical cyclones of the entire season. It was the last one. Now, why tell you about all this? Because look at what it did to our drop monitor. Soaked this area, fried that area. And where were we? Right in the middle. Now, in Illinois, current drop monitor, we got a little swath right in through here. One of my good friends, Todd Gleason from WILL, his farm is right there. It's the only farm in the state that right now I think is sitting there at the third stage of drought. Oh, those some surrounding farms there in Logan County. But you look at this and you just got to remember that 60% of the country right now is covered in drought. And what I'm going to tell you that I'm most concerned about for the state of Illinois, so listen carefully. In our state, this drought's not going to go away. Reason why? Soil stays frozen all winter long, snow piles up on top of it, snow doesn't have much water content in it, and by the way, it's all going to melt off in the spring, come down the rivers. That's going to be a drought that's going to be there once we start spring. This area here, right in the southern plains, I'll put a big X in it, that is what you need to watch. If that area fills in with drought between now and May, I'm worried about Illinois. And if that fills in and it gets dry here as well, that is also not good. Because if that Bermuda high, let me show you this, if that Bermuda high goes from here to there, game on. We're going to get flow around it and tons of thunderstorms. But you do not want the Bermuda high to become the Memphis high. That might mean something else, doesn't it? Because if that Memphis high comes in there, ooh, it's going to smoke us out and not in the way of good barbecue. It's going to shut us down for, for moisture. Those are the things that I'll watch most carefully as we progress forward with this drought monitor. Now, I want to talk to you about flash drought because there is a valuable lesson in here. August got us. Nebraska, driest. Iowa, third driest. And that is despite the duration. Illinois, 13th driest time period on record. And in the month before that, in July, we got hammered with storms, including that big 
a, a hailstorm that went right through the middle part of Illinois here. We're still cleaning up damage for that. In fact, my church last night, we had a meeting talking about how we're going to get the roof repaired. It was a nasty go of it this year. Well, this is a, a product that I can give you, send it out to you. You can follow me and I'll make sure you get it. But it is satellite-based soil moisture, top four inches. Now, what I'm going to show you is from July the 15th, how this flash drought set up. Are you ready? As we play this, moving it forward, we see that through much of July. See the green showing up in here? These were some of the big storms that raced through. But look back at Iowa. We started to see drought emerge in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota here, such that through the month of July, that drought seemed to get worse and worse in this particular spot. Now, we were doing okay in July across much of Illinois until we got into August. Now, big rains began August, especially in the southern half of the state. Look at that. Look how wet it was in the southern half of the state. But as we then move forward, look at what happened by mid-August toward the end of August. In fact, let's just stop there on August 27th. Nebraska, South Dakota, Iowa, Northern Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, super dry. Hurricanes still slam in the southeast. But this is what flash drought is. It took three weeks to take us down below 2% on soil moisture for the northern half of the state. And to get over there to Iowa and Nebraska was even worse. As that happened, yeah, we had a derecho come through. But what did derechos do? They move fast. And therefore, it put down rain, but it was too quick to do anything. I'll show it to you in a moment. We then had, at the beginning of September, a, a shot at some relief that came through right there. But then watch what happened toward the end of September, now going into October. And it got really, really dry for our harvest throughout much of this state. The southern half of the state fared better than the northern half of the state. That's for certain. And we tucked right here in the middle. We're just that. We were tucked away in the middle. But let me show you what happened. My good friend Chad Colby went out and flew a Cessna around, saw this field fire right here in central Illinois. Look at the burn scar. And I think you included this uh, farm credit Illinois in your promotional video. South Dakota, this field ripped through a, 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 a fire here. And uh, this particular farmer actually tried to go out and harvest this. He did at least have a sense of humor. He said, yeah, I harvested it. It was at 3% moisture, but all my corn was cooked. And I've been using this particular um, uh, picture here to explain to my kids that when you uh, cook field corn, it doesn't pop. They just don't know that yet, but they're learning. Uh, but that's uh, that's what uh, what happened with this very, very dry end of the season we had to endure. Now, we had severe weather, but it was primarily in the northern plains. Beautiful view here of the storm in Grand Forks putting down this big tornado. In fact, my friend Michael Martz got out and chased after this tornado in Minnesota. Now, that's a pretty narrow tornado. We call them a rope. But look at this sucker going into the back of that supercell. I am not brave enough to be Michael here. He's about 80 yards from that as it ripped through that soybean field here. That's way too close for me. I've seen these suckers throw debris out miles. You're not going to get me that close to a tornado as much as I do enjoy storm chasing. But you notice with the ridge out in the west, our storms had this trajectory. Now I'm just showing you an example here from July the 11th. Storms coming out of Minnesota, Iowa, cutting across Illinois. And I tossed in a picture of some of the wind damage here uh, from a field up in Pontiac, Illinois. We did get green snap. I mean, this field just saw a lot of destruction here. But we did have our fair share of nasty weather, including the hail, including these windstorms. And also, I want to at least show you what happened with that derecho. So in the middle of a drought, massive storm system races through. Starts in South Dakota, Nebraska, cuts through Illinois, produces 15 reports of tornadoes in Illinois, and brings in this brief but violent storm system to Iowa. Now, as it went racing through, it did a lot of damage. Cedar Rapids looked like this for about 25 minutes. They saw winds gusting from 80 to 130 miles an hour, just destroying everything in its path. And the infrastructure that was destroyed, plus the crop that was laid over, well, my initial assessment of this when I got my first good satellite image looked like this. And I could see damage in these areas to the tune of about, my initial estimate was 8.5 million acres. Now we since know that, uh, that uh, some of the data has come out that showed us much higher damage amounts. And we've seen the USDA reports catch up on this, especially in January, some of the crop production losses were from this particular duration. But I got asked a good question this morning. I'm gonna tell you the answer to it. How often do these things happen? For Iowa and Illinois, about once a decade. There was a nasty one in Southern Illinois back in 2008. Uh, 2011, we had the big one that came through Iowa, Southern Wisconsin, and Northern Illinois. And so these are not frequent, but when they come through, boy, you better hope you got that insurance product because this is, uh, it'll pay off for itself one go around.
Now we have hail damage every year. We have wind damage every year, but I'm talking about derecho events like this. They are nasty. Um, I couldn't imagine being a farmer and not every year picking up on a multi peril product that would cover me for this kind of stuff because you live in the United States. We are the hotbed for severe weather. 75% of the world's tornadoes are in the central plains of the United States. And we get these storms that we come through. We love them and we hate them. We love them because they bring in the rain. We hate them because they can destroy our crops. And this is what happened this past year. Now, I want to broaden our perspective here and get into the forecast part of this discussion here and some longer term statistics too. In the background, all summer long was this animation. Are you ready? As I play it, watch right here in the Central Pacific. The blue colors represent the colder than normal ocean temperatures that emerged from July now through mid-January. And that La Nina that showed up there is going to be instructive on where things are going for the rest of this winter and even into spring and summer. Here's a quick refresher for you, okay? El Nino first. If you're a farmer in Illinois, you want the waters off the west coast of South America to be warm. That's in El Nino because it redistributes the precipitation across the world, in fact, but we tend to be wetter uh, across much of the United States, especially in the Midwest. So you want an El Nino summer almost every summer. We want to avoid La Ninas, and that's because La Nina, when the water's cool, well, it redistributes most of the moisture over here in Australia, Indonesia, Southeast Asia. In fact, I had a, a conversation last night with some of our growers in Australia. We were talking pretty late into the evening about the risk they were having down here for growing wine. It's actually raining too much for them right now because of this La Nina. On the flip side of that, we tend to have drier risks in the United States and in South America. And I'll finish today talking about that dry, dryness in South America. But we've been keeping track of these things forever. Our last big El Nino was here, 2015, 2016. Last big La Nina was right there, 2010, 2011. But why I'm showing you this graph is to remind you that most El Nino and La Nina events peak right at the turn of the new year. And this one right down here is doing just that. And it's beginning to fade, but it's gonna be around with us for a while as it begins to fade. And why we care so much about that is because of what La Ninas do. You know our weather comes from the West, right? Well, our westward progression of the jet stream tends to be robbed a bit when there's a La Nina. It tends to slow the thing down, lets it get stuck. And when it gets stuck, we don't like that. We like to be unclogged, all right? We want the El Nino factor in there. We want the jet stream to just be screaming out of the West, bringing us routine weather systems. Well, La Ninas don't do that. They tend to give us more blocked weather patterns, leading to more drought, especially in summer. So given that, over the next couple of months, remember what I told you at the beginning? This is February, March, and April forecast of ocean temperatures. You got a warm tongue here and there, but right in through here, you see the fading La Nina. It's still pushing hard in the Central Pacific, but we got a bit of a warming trend back over here towards South America. Now remember, through February, March, and April, I'm just gonna switch over to, uh, I'll switch to red here. I need you to watch everything that's between those, well, inside this red polygon I just drew there, right in here. Because if it's not red and instead it is, uh, if it's blue like this, by the time we get into spring, that is a red flag. Sorry for all the color references here for us in the Midwest. Now at this point, let's make sure that everything is clear. We do not see in this area right now, major risk for it going cold. But if it does, I'm gonna be concerned about our upcoming summer uh, drought concerns. Now, I'm gonna give you that forecast in a minute, but I wanted to put that back into your brain. Now, to add to that discussion, I wanna come right into Illinois, Iowa, and I'm gonna talk about the whole of the Corn Belt. Over the last 70 years, if you look at this, over the last 70 years, drought is becoming less frequent for us. In fact, we are more often dealing with too much water than not enough. You can see the big droughts, 76, 88, and also right here in 2012. But put this stat in the back of your mind, and I've told this group this in the past, over the last 70 years, we've added 5.5 inches of total rainfall. Unfortunately, that rainfall delivery mechanism is changing a lot. And here's some new research I've been doing for nutrient over the last year and a half. In the state of Iowa and in the state of Illinois, we have doubled and tripled the frequency of our big two inch rainfall events per day. In fact, I was down in Southern Illinois two years ago talking to a farmer, he's 80 years old. He'd been farming for 50 years. And when we had this conversation, he pulled me aside and I will talk to a guy that's been in the industry that long any day of the week. And he says, I gotta ask you a question. 
I said, what's that? He goes, wasn't this last weekend weird? I said, what do you mean? He goes, it rained for three days. We got about a half inch of rain every day. My field sucked it all in and everything was perfectly fine. I said, what's the problem? He goes, it doesn't do that anymore, does it? I said, no, you said we get most of our rain from big events. He says, I know it, I've been seeing the changes. And you know what he told me that he did to, uh, to take care of those changes? He re-pattern tiled his fields just to handle the excess water when it was there. We gotta be thinking about that because here's some other statistics I wanna share with you. Now, the map on the right just shows you the research. The data is in the state on the left. I've been looking at April and May and trying to understand if our planting windows are getting tighter. Due to increased amounts of heavy rainfall, combined with increased frequency of rainfall events, since, 19, since the 1980s, look at the number right here in red. Across the state of Illinois, we've lost about five field days where we can get out and do our field work. Now, this hasn't really been a problem because our equipment's gotten bigger. And therefore, when we need to plant, we can plant. Think back to 2018. Remember that? April 2018, coldest on record. May 2018, warmest on record. We planted at a pace of 400 acres a minute across the state of Illinois. Now, thinking about moisture, look at this. This is looking at the trend in something called PWAT, precipitable water. Since the 1970s, we have increased the total amount of moisture in the atmosphere that can be rained out on our fields by 15%. That's also helped increase our overnight temperatures by about three degrees, which has lengthened our growing season by nine days on average. You see, when folks are talking about climate change, this is what it really is. And as a farmer, we need to take this information and monetize it. We need to take this information and use it to make better decisions to increase profitability and maintain sustainable efforts. Because the same thing's true with our specific humidity. We've increased it by 6%. And when we think about all these changes, what it means is going into the longer term, I've got to show you one of my favorite videos. We got to figure out better ways to manage our water. Now, clearly this young man here has got the wrong idea. Taking a five gallon bucket and throwing it over the fence is not gonna keep the water on the neighbor's property. You know, when I think about successful management of water, I think about the way that we use the ground. I think about the experts in the field at our extension offices, at Illinois Farm Credit, those folks that are out there studying the best practices in order to help us keep the water when we, when we need it, and get rid of it when we don't, in a way that preserves the soil nutrient content and is sustainable for all that downstream uh, washout that we do get. This is the most important factor that the Illinois farmer is going to face moving forward. Now, from here, what I'm going to spend my last little bit of time doing is I'm going to talk about how we forecast this stuff. And let's stretch this all the way out to a summer forecast here in a few minutes. Now, something I want everybody on the call to listen very carefully to. Two things. The bulk of weather forecasting, modern weather forecasting, is done with numerical weather prediction, our models, and they're good. That animation you're watching over there on the right, that was from Monday. I put out my weather video, there's a risk of severe weather across the southeast. I did that early Monday morning, and by Monday night, the models had really advertised the chances for some severe storms. Now, I am not sure if you've seen this, because I know it was shared across national media, uh, and probably even shared on the Weather Channel. I don't watch the Weather Channel. I love those guys, they're brilliant. But uh, I don't have time for commercials and storm stories. I need to see what the weather's going to do. But this was a picture that was shared. A guy in Alabama had his NOAA weather radio on, and it sent out a siren telling him that there was a nearby storm that was capable of producing a tornado. Now, he was sleeping on this side of the bed. His wife was here, and their child was in the play yard. That radio went off. He jumped out of bed, got the wife up, got the kid out, and they went and took shelter. And this two by six came through the wall and went right to where his wife was sleeping. Now, this is how you can put a value on good weather information. Now, given that, I got asked a good question. I got asked this yesterday to a group I was talking to in North Dakota. How do I use your weather information? I'm going to tell you how. Our weather forecasting skill is really dependent on the accuracy of two modeling centers. One is run here in the United States. Its flagship model is called the GFS. The other major center is the Europeans, the ECMWF. And the European center, honestly, right now is a better forecasting system. I could show it to you statistically, but I'm just gonna tell you, 
it performs better and therefore I favor it. I'm not gonna shy away from another model from another country if it is the best one for you, despite its $250,000 a year price tag that Nutrien pays just so I can show it to you. Now, given that, what I wanna show you is this, and I can't, I can't stress how much you need to remember this, okay? You got a graphic here that shows you forecast accuracy. And this comes back to answering the question I shared a few moment ago, which is, how do I use your information? Through the next 10 days, our forecasting skill is good. The numerical weather prediction side of it is good. Beyond about day eight, nine, or 10, forecast skill drops off dramatically. We call this no man's land, right here, day 15 to day 45. And that's because everybody in that box of time wants an accurate day-by-day -day forecast. Yet it is physically impossible and will always be physically impossible to give you an accurate day-by-day -day forecast. Now we can make improvements on our skill, but to be accurate at that time period is impossible because the atmosphere is nonlinear and its behavior and chaotic. But people will try to sell you that they can do that. So before I show you how someone tried to sell it to us, let me tell you this. Use my forecast set to about eight, nine, 10 days to plan your operations. Figure out your week. Know when the rain's gonna get there. Understand what the soil temperature's gonna do. Use it to understand when you can spray, do applications, know when to plant, find the windows. Out to about 10 days, we're solid. Use everything beyond that to understand two aspects of weather forecasting. One, use it to probabilistically, <clears throat> excuse me, probabilistically understand the risk. We can tell you out there day 15 to day 120 what the risks are in terms of being above average or below average in terms of precip and temperature. But day by day, we can't give you a forecast out that far. And the second thing is to remember, let me get a drink of coffee here. <clears throat> there we go. The second thing to remember is this. The markets watch everything beyond day 10. And people watch what we have to say about the weather. And occasionally throughout the year, there's a big weather premium in the market. But please remember this next story. And if you've heard it from me before, I don't care, I'm gonna tell it to you again. There was a company a couple of years ago in 2016 telling every farmer in the Midwest to get ready for $7 corn. They were predicting massive drought. I watched their promotional video. They said that every single day they did, now would you look at this number? I'll write it for you, 61 times 10 to the 103rd power calculations to predict your day-by-day -day weather for the next 11 months and they claimed 90 percent accuracy i'm like holy smokes where did you get that computer because ibm has one called watson and every day it can only do 10 times 10 to the 24th calculations that's still a lot but far short of 61 times 10 to 103rd and by the way let me give you another big number it's the number 10 times 10 to the 80th power you see that number right there that is the number of known atoms in the universe. And here's a company selling you the snake oil of telling you that they can calculate 23 orders of magnitude more data points in a day than there are known atoms in the universe. And by the way, in 2016, when they were predicting $7 corn, which you see down here, they missed the mark in a big way. It is proof that we can't do it. And if you need more proof, I'm gonna tell you one thing I've told every crowd in the last 10 years that I've been teaching about the weather, and it is this. If I could forecast the weather accurately six months in advance, I would not tell you about it. I'd be in Chicago making trades and retiring. I would have already been retired for crying out loud. So what do we know? The near term is getting affected by this big cyclone right here. It is slamming into California. And in my morning report, I zoomed in and showed you just a beautiful animation of all the little vortices spinning around this deep low. Now it is hammering California, but it is actually gonna hammer the Midwest in the coming days. Let me show what I'm talking about here. First of all, over the last 72 hours, it has put in some places in California, two to six inches of rainfall. Now we've got hit over here in Southern Illinois as well. Remember we had a storm system that rolled through here just yesterday bringing in snow. Uh, this is what Jeff was talking about coming up I-57. The snow from that was pretty rough go of it because it made things quite slick here. By the way, it wasn't much as Jeff said, but it was enough to make things rough. The big snow over the last three days was back here and in the West. And that system that came through the Western part of the United States, it's gotta make up for the fact that right now in the Sierra Nevada mountains, 
there are some places with a 150 inch deficit in snowfall. But we expect once this system is done in the West Coast to have an additional 10 feet of snow at the highest peaks of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. So if you like to ski, you better head west, all right? These are the areas I'm watching most carefully. Inside of each one of those uh, dashed lines, I think we're gonna see some major changes in the snowfall amounts. And I'm gonna explain to you especially what's going on right here. Now, Jeff, I would like to show you, this was what came through yesterday, spreading that light soon through Kentucky, Southern Indiana, and Southern Illinois. And it made things disastrously slicker on, on I-57 right into there. It put snow down over here in parts of uh, North Carolina this morning. And if you think that this part of the country can't handle much snow, North Carolina shut down on just a couple of inches. They can't handle it at all. In the west, that stream of moisture watch is again coming into California right there. In fact, if I can try to play that again, let's watch it one more time. There it is. This is the culprit that is gonna be bringing in big time snows for parts of Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. And I wanna to talk to you about that. So that jet stream pattern, remember I told you it gets really wavy when there's a La Nina? Well, here's the wave we're gonna watch next. And as it comes over toward us, let's get to it and see how things are gonna shake down. So I'm gonna just gonna highlight one specific event right here. What we did is we watched that animation one more time, is that storm, snowstorm that went across California should be over St. Louis by Saturday night. And if you notice on the northern side of this, we're basically along I-74 is where we're expecting to see some snow. Now, if this low goes any farther to the south, for example, if it hits Paducah, oh, most of Illinois Farm Credit's territory is gonna get a big helping of snow. But as it stands, it's gonna go right over the top of Effingham and then make its way over to Southern Indiana and eventually to Northern Kentucky. Snow doesn't get here into south of I-72. It doesn't look like until Sunday afternoon and evening. And that system goes on off to the east. And behind it, high pressure builds in. But then notice, California got hit again. And there's another storm system on February 4th into the 5th that's going to come across the midsection of the country too. Now, we don't know where this one's going to be just yet. It's 192 hours from now. And therefore, if it slides at all to the south, there's more snow for us. But if it goes north, that's a lot of rain coming through here. Now, it'll be interesting because we're going to yank that groundhog out of his cage before this and get his opinion on the weather. And as I've told you in the past, remember, the groundhog has no predictive skill. He's wrong more often than he is right. He needs to actually consult a meteorologist, but he's too tired to do it. Because remember, the groundhog should be hibernating this time of year. But we'll at least get a prediction from him a couple of days before this event. It's going to stay active right through our part of the country. And that low, well, here's all the model forecast telling you where it's going to be. somewhere. <laughs> centered on Effingham. But if it's on the southern side of this, that snow line is going to be south of I-72. If it's on the northern side of this up by Springfield, the snow line is going to be up around I-80. There's still uncertainty that few days out. But the probability of getting three inches of snow, it's right here. This is your chance of getting three inches of snow. And here's your chance of getting six inches of snow. So it's going to be primarily north of I-74 that the best chances of getting heaviest snow is going to be. Beyond that, here's that next system. Told you there's a lot of spread in the forecast, but at least we can get a look out here eight days in advance to know when and where that thing's going to be. Now, I don't want you to take this map home with you and say, wait a minute, Snodgrass said, but right now the heaviest snow corridor, according to the European model, is right through here, meeting up with the system running up the East Coast. And that's what kind of some of the snowfall mounts are currently looking like. From there, look at the jet stream. Big ridge in the Gulf of Alaska, deep trough here. And there's a ridge right down there. That trough is going to sweep through. Now, what am I telling you this for? When troughs come flying through the central plains of the United States, like they're doing out of day 10 and out of day 15, we just tend to stay wet and active. Storm track coming through the Ohio River Valley, just like that. We're going to stay there. Now, what about those temperatures? Because it has been very warm over the last month. And no, we would not have expected this to be so warm across the Canadian prairie. You see, the weather would tell us that if there's a La Nina, it's going to be cold there. But why it hasn't been warm is because all the cold air has been over here. It's been in Russia. It's been in Kazakhstan, China, Mongolia, Siberia, not on this side of the planet. Because the polar vortex split and sent all the cold air over there. Our polar vortex is severely disrupted. And right now, it's got all its coldest air on the other side of the planet. All I want you to remember is, when the polar vortex is strong like this, all the cold air stays inside of it, and everybody that hates winter is happy. But if the polar vortex splits like it did back in 2019 with one piece coming over the Hudson Bay, 
Well, do you remember this video I showed you last year? Young lady here soaked her pants in water, tossed them up in the sky at minus 30 degree weather. They froze in mid-flight. And as they uh, came back down to the ground, as you might remember from my video a year ago, <laughs> they stuck the landing perfectly. Now, that polar vortex is disrupted, which means I think Bernie's well-dressed for what we're going to be seeing here in the Midwest as we go forward. Let's get to it. You ready? Over the next few days, yeah, we're cold today, but there's going to be a warm-up in the middle part of the United States for this weekend. There's Friday into Saturday. Now, when I say warm, it's relative to this time of year, but with that system sliding through Sunday getting into Monday, we cool back off across the state of Illinois. But what I want to show you is how things change in the day five through 10. See the cold air piling up here? And here, by the time we get to day 11 through 15, old Bernie will be well-dressed because this is going to start to come across the United States in shots of cold air, not sticking around for 10, 20, 30 days. But middle of February is going to feel like the middle of February, and it's going to have these cold shots of air. What I don't know is how big that ridge is going to be over the southeast. But I'll tell you this, if the cold air is here and we are in between the two, this is where all the action is. So February could be fun, and I think I might be happy that I own two snowblowers right now. We had one that broke. I fixed it after we bought a new one. So I've got two, which means my eight-year-old gets to run one of them. Now let's go longer term as I wrap this up and talk about South America here in a few moments. This La Nina is fading. And if we think about what that's going to mean for us, a fading La Nina tends to favor a lot more colder air coming from this direction out of the west. It also tends to build a ridge right down here over the southeast. And in between the two, look at the preset map over there on the left, February 13th to March 12th, it's gonna be wet. That means the likelihood of drought developing as we get into early, early spring across Illinois, parts of the Mid-South, Eastern Corn Belt is low. But let's come back to that La Nina again. What's it gonna do? Well, February, March, and April, remember, it's still there, but it's weakening with time. And thinking about that, we have to come back to our drought concerns. Are we gonna see drought develop here? And is the drought in the West gonna get any better? Well, to do that, let's look at the long range models. Now, I need you to tune into my forecast after February 5th. Now, I want you to watch them every day, but after February 5th, we get brand new three month outlooks. These are the outlooks for February, March, and April. Active Ohio River Valley storm track. South of that line, the models keep forecasting dry. Now, you look over there at the temperature map, and you go, well, it's looking warm, yeah, maybe by a degree or two, which is still cold in February and March and April. If we get cold air, it will be coming from the north and west, but it appears that getting 10, 20, 30 days of super cold air is going to be relatively limited. We'll get shots of it, but it won't stick around. The three-month outlook from the NMME, these are models run in North America. That's what the N stands for. Same line, south of it dry active Ohio River Valley storm track. Warmth, but remember, it's still winter. Be a couple degrees above average doesn't mean it's going to be uh, hot. Support also comes from the statistical analysis from the University of Columbia. Look at this, south of that line dry, active Ohio River Valley storm track. We see above average temperatures for the most part to finish winter. I'm gonna say it again. When we get shots of colder air, they will show up and it will get cold, but they'll be that shots, five, six, seven days of colder air, and then we warm back up again. So we're gonna have an active, a very active freeze thaw cycle going forward. And that means a lot for our soil health. Now, I should not show you this, but I'm gonna show it to you anyway. This is the May, June, and July outlook. I was talking to a group in California two days ago, and I did not enjoy that conversation. Because May, June, and July, where the drought is still widespread, seems as though that's where it's going to go back to with the heat and the dryness. And if we end up building another ridge out to the west, the flow comes over the top of it like this, we tend to get more of those thunderstorms during summer. So at this point, the long-term risk for drought is relatively limited. But you need to remember this. Forecast skill at this time is practically zero. I am merely showing you one possible scenario. I've got to wait until we get into March and April before I really refine this forecast. But let's come back to the reason why I talked about the dust, the dust Bowl. You see that in through this area for May, June, and July, we don't, we don't see the cold water emerging. If the model is wrong and it is cold in here, then what you need to remember is 
these areas of drier conditions here will spread east. The only other thing I'm going to tell you to worry about is over the southeast. Now, the models are not forecasting this yet, but if it gets dry in early summer over the southeast and that creeps toward Kentucky, then we in Illinois need to be on the lookout for this. In my last three minutes, what I want to talk with you about is South America. Now, we've had a projection all season long of 132 million metric ton of soybeans that would follow the exponential increase in their production to hit an average number for this year. Remember, Brazil only farms 8% of its arable land. They've got a lot more pasture land, not rainforest, but pasture land they can convert over to farmland. That inset map tells you where they grow a lot of soybeans. And just remember, you can fit Texas inside of Mato Grosso. Now, given that, what I want to show you next is some new research I've been doing about Brazil. They have been getting drier and drier in September and October. For the last 40 years, this trend is real. Now, why do you care about that? Well, in years where we tend to also give us drier conditions throughout their growing season, like 2020 and 2021 has been, where all the wet weather is over here in Australia, Indonesia, and Southeast Asia because of La Nina, and the drier weather is here, any delays they have in getting that crop in are going to carry throughout the season. So that figure on the left shows you that compared to the 40-year normal and all of the years, all 40 of them in the data set, the last 180 days for Mato Grosso, which is right here, has been the driest on record. They've been getting precip, but they've missed out on over two feet of rain. Now, 30% of the soybeans are grown in Mato Grosso, and they're trying to get those beans harvested right now, but they are way behind. I'll show you that in a moment. A point to bring up, southern Brazil, Argentina, lately have been getting much, much more precipitation than Brazil's northern and eastern growing areas. And that's why when you look at the root zone soil moisture, we have better conditions here and here, but the dryness is in eastern Brazil and northern Brazil. From there, current harvest progress is going to continue to follow the bottom of this envelope which means we will likely have to cover in our export market 15 to 21 days, just given the delay of getting this crop out. If there's a strike, if there's any weather problems, this is just gonna get worse and worse for Mato Grosso, which is the, where we harvest those first crop of beans. During the dry spells, they've actually been quite hot as well. Over the last 40 days, been five to seven degrees Celsius above average. So we've had really high evaporative transport here as well, meaning that the crop in the Eastern part of Brazil has been stressed. The wild card is, even though we expect the yield to come down, did they plant 2 million more acres or 4 million more acres or 6 million more acres? Because they can make up for any deficit here with having a good amount of acreage. Over the next seven days, we're dry in the same areas, very wet in Southern Brazil and in Argentina, which is why the risk is gonna be in the North as we go forward. They're gonna get the Safrina crop out late, they're, excuse me, they're going to get the first crop out late and the Safrina crop in late, which means you all better be watching what I have to say about April when they're trying to harvest that Safrina crop uh, just after it fills, uh, you know, those kernels and to see if we've got problems with grain fill due to drought later as well. Jeff, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Uh, you listened to me for a solid hour and I appreciate that. Uh, let's just turn it over to some questions here if we've got time and, and we'll go from there. All right. Eric, I want to lead one here, and I really, really appreciated the way you started the program, um, looking back at uh, the, the 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 Dust Bowl era. So let's think about this. In Washington, we're talking about climate policy. We've been looking yeah. at precision conservation practices uh, in the state, corn and soy now working together on those. Uh, in a historical question to modern day, how much of the Dust Bowl was because of farmer tillage practices and how much it was atmosphere. And the reason that I ask that is because let's say that we develop this policy and let's say that, that farmers even more than they're already doing adopt cover crops, a drop, uh, you know, new practices that we can verify or are sequestering carbon in the soil. We're doing all these things. Oh yeah. But if mom nature, if mom nature doesn't go along with us, 
then we may not get the credit for and 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 in the long run may have a finger pointed at us because of it great question so let's do this here's the way to think about it go back to history remember we had another nasty drought in the southern plains in the 1950s yet no dust bowl in fact you could argue that the drought in the southern plains of the 1950s was worse than the dust bowl yet the change in soil conservation changed how bad it had an impact on the crops that were grown so when you think about these policies right versus thinking about what our agronomists what our soil scientists what our extension offices what the researchers are telling us it would just make sense to put in a plan to adopt these strategies for two reasons and you hit on both of them resiliency is everything i want to be profitable year on year and the better I treat my ground, everybody in this call knows this, the better you treat your ground, the, the better the chances are you're going to have good yields, despite what Mother Nature can throw at you. The second part of this is, I think it's going to be critical to watch how this administration and its policies on the issues of climate change start to think about what it would look like to develop you know, a, a carbon credit system. Now, I'm not an expert in that. we got to talk to economists. And Jeff, you know a lot about it. But I'm going to tell everybody in the call something important. The farmer is a major component of the solution to this. And I'm just gonna say it in this way, I believe that every farmer needs to be thinking about the issues of climate change from the perspective of an emerging market. Because if our sustainable practices are valued like we're told they're valued, that will change the value of the crop we grow and what it does to sequester carbon. So Jeff, we could go a whole other three or four hours sure. talking about this because it is sure. it is the biggest question. So uh, but that would so, be the way I'd give you the short answer. So in the summary, what's right for the soil is right for the soil. We can't control mom nature, but if we can make the soil uh, a better profile, sequester more carbon, overall more healthy, then uh, regardless of the circumstance, we come out better. Okay, we know that the yeah. crop insurance price is established during the month of February, and gee, that starts next week. So if the two major fundamentals in the marketplace now are demand, aka China, which is not on, on, on your dossier for the, for the day, but weather yeah. is, uh, when we think about what weather is going to be taking place in February, when we think about the harvest that is going to be taking place in the Southern Hemisphere in February, what are likely outcomes or what are dates on the calendar that we should be paying close attention for the ability to move this market one direction or the other? Yeah, uh, I'll answer the first question first, then we'll talk dates. I have no reason why I would tell you that based purely on weather, so this is purely on weather, that we won't continue to see supportive markets. And here's my reason why. We know that there's been problems in South America, okay? And we're gonna start to see those problems manifest themselves when the crop gets harvested, which is happening now through February. Uh, and, and so we, the question is, is how much of a problem? I don't think that the markets have underbaked the problem though this far. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's there and I think they know it. The second thing is we all still see that 60% of the country is in drought. And we know that winter time isn't the time we break drought. It tends to be spring rains. So going through February and March into April, we have to wait to see if the spring rains undo my concerns about drought, and you better believe they can. So here's the dates I'm gonna tell you to watch. Now, these are weather dates, not uh, price dates or anything. February 15th, by day after Valentine's Day, I'll have a pretty good handle on what for, uh, harvest progress will look like, and we'll get some early numbers from our boots on the ground on what those yields look like from Mato Grosso, Goyas, Tocantins, Northern Mato Grosso do Sol. At that point, we'll also be past the midway point in winter. I'll know if this La Nina does have a grip on the weather patterns for spring. The next date, I wanna take you ahead. We're gonna skip March, we're gonna skip April, and I'm gonna to get to May 15th. On May 15th, we will then know if that drought area has been eroded in the Northern Plains. We will know if the Northern Plains will be having troubles getting their crop in and if we should expect some prevent plant acres. We will also know by May 15th if we hit our early stride in planting the crop in the Midwest. And I actually think that this year is gonna have some early planting opportunities. I will also know by May 15th if the waters off the southwestern coast of the United States did what the models say they're not gonna do and if they cooled off. 
And at that point, we'll see the drop picture and we'll know if there's continued support for a better than normal spring rally. But I will tell you, unlike any other year, I have been asked by more people than I've ever been asked, how much should they be worried about drop? And if they're worried about it, they're making decisions based on their marketing plan about it. And therefore the funds and the commercials, everybody's thinking about it. And therefore I don't think until we have concrete evidence to the otherwise that we would have problems, or excuse me, that we aren't, that we shouldn't expect to have problems until we don't, right? And that's always the case. So one more with the Southern Hemisphere. Um, it was easy to document the headlines that were talking about the challenges that Brazil was facing with lake planting. And obviously we're seeing yeah. that now with the harvest phase. So we can verify that particular fundamental. But when I think about the reports that are coming as late, those private consultancies are still talking about a crop. No, not as big as they were forecasting before the planting but still bigger than last year's still record big. with regard to soybeans and the verdict is still out on corn. So look in your crystal ball, not that we're making marking decisions <laughs> off of this, but, but yeah. give us from a statistical standpoint of weather, what should we expect to verify from the final and how much of that is still up in the air with moisture? So here's the first bit of this. I attempted to correlate every one of these years on precipitation with yield and Mato Grosso. It doesn't work because generally they get they actually get enough rain during the season. What tends to correlate more with yield is when they get the crop planted, which we know was delayed, and how much heat they had, which is why I showed you that it had been somewhere in here, that it had been uh, warm. I got it in there somewhere. Now, when you see these dips down in yield here, yes. notice that they don't vary too much around their mean. It's pretty darn close to their average. This year, if they even come down 15%, they still hit 129 million metric ton crop. So that's crops big, but I think it comes back to what you said earlier. We know that there's demand. We've seen the purchases, right? We know there's demand. And we think that everybody's already baked in the fact that this crop could still be somewhere between a 128 and a 134 crop. Maybe it's somewhere sitting in the middle of that. Um, some numbers that I hear tossed around all the time are actually squarely on 130 to 131. So uh, I, I do not see that there's going to be a major surprise coming out of the harvest of the first crop of soybeans. Uh, the surprises could be on political decisions in South America and demand Fair from enough. China. Argentina. So Argentina had earlier in the season... Uh, pockets of drought in the wrong spots, Cordoba, Santa Fe, Buenos Aires. And they've had two time periods, just like those just-in-time rains we sometimes get in July and early August. Well, they had two time periods and a third one coming up where it looks like the storms are going to come through and try to save the day. I was talking with a good friend of mine, Arlen Suderman. He said, well, some of the earliest planted uh, corn, which is about 10% of their total crop, they said it was just too dry during grain fill. But it's 10%. And could the other 90% make up for it. He says, there's a good possibility. And I look longer term and at this point through the next couple of weeks, I don't see major stresses for, for Argentina uh, going forward. So I don't think it's gonna bake into the story here as to be a major concern moving forward. I'm sorry, I was checking with uh, the folks here on screen. Uh, I have one more for you and, and folks who are about to close the program here in our are uh, so grateful that uh, Eric has been able to be with us today. But if you do have a question, uh, as we're going to the closing here, if you've got a closing question or comment for Eric, just go there to the questions tab and and certainly offer that. Um, uh, Eric, I, I enjoy, uh, I'm like you, I don't have time for the Weather Channel's commercials and the rest. And frankly, I think uh, they try to do things that make people wanna watch uh, a lot sure. more often so they can sell more They're commercials. Enough, enough, said, enough said about that. <laughs> um, so, but I so much enjoy and look forward to, uh, that early morning forecast. You and I, I'm not sure what time you start. I start about 3 AM. I know you start very early, but I look forward to that update in the morning, um, uh, of, of your, your forecast. So if those folks that are watching this morning, uh, or listening in here on our, our, uh, our zoom call, 
uh, or this vid virtual conference. I'm sorry, I'll get the words correct. This is all new material for an old guy. But if people want your stuff, Eric, how do they get it? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I I'm going to do something to myself here that I should not do, but I'm going to tell it to you because I see we've got 132 oh, okay. attendees on right now. All right. There you go. So Jeff gets this morning email from me, and it's free. All right, and uh, and and I, I, I if, if you send me an email, Eric dot snodgrass at nutrient.com uh, i'll start sending you my daily morning updates and here's what happens it just shows up in your inbox and uh and, and if you want to look at the weather today open it if you don't just delete it it'll be there tomorrow i do that every single day uh jeff i start at 2 a.m on mondays and thursdays i start wow. at 4 30 on the other days of the week but you wow. know what i gotta be honest i wake up and i'm like sweet let's get this done and you know what's beautiful about those time periods nobody bothers you okay so you get work done uh but it's it's a race in the morning again uh, 132 of you eric dot snodgrass in fact wait a second here i'll make this a little bit easier wow. i've got yeah we went through 112 slides by the way i don't know if it felt like that but uh here, here it is just so you can see it eric dot snodgrass at newtune.com you shoot me an email i'll add you to the list you can unsubscribe if you don't like the content you can just unsubscribe to it we got a brand new service we're going to be using to put that out i'll get you added you'll be get start getting stuff from me uh, from ne uh, next week and uh, it's just it's just content it just provides some insights on the weather and i hope to become that trusted advisor giving you the information that i i hope you find useful so eric that's snodgrass at nutrient.com you went further than i expected i was just talking about your 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 forecast that you put together and, and you verbalized that's that man that's an i added. did it for you jeff because you're a good guy i want everybody to have what you got you got the best all right <laughs> you are the man i appreciate it very much folks i uh, yeah. if we were in the audience right now or you were there i'd ask you to give a round of applause for eric so we'll just do the high five there on the screen thanks buddy uh, i look forward to talking <laughs> to you in a few minutes i hope folks we're going to wrap this uh fielding forward meeting up right now a recording of Today's program uh, is available. It will be available soon at www.farmcreditil.com and then slash FF for Fielding Forward. Uh, also, program survey is going to pop up after this webinar, and a link will be there and a follow-up email. Uh, don't forget this, Farm Credit Illinois Winter Learning Programs. We have the Fielding Forward Crop Panel coming next Thursday right here. Um, the fourth, we'll have Steve Johnson back from Iowa. We'll have Matt Bennett with agmarket.net and a couple of folks on crop insurance. Uh, next week will be an excellent program. We'll be building off of weather and plugging in some of these other demand issues that are continuing to unfold. Also, don't forget on Tuesday, February 9th, estate planning. Uh, that has taken place. More information is available uh, at Farm Credit Illinois, the website. Uh, if you are eligible for a Fresh Roots voucher, be on the lookout for an email by the end of today. And if you don't see it in your main inbox, yep, check the spam of the junk folder. It may have slipped over there. Well, we do have a door prize that we are offering for the day. It is uh, 50 pounds of ice melt. I'm kidding. Um, that's a little tough to ship, but we do have a really nice door prize. It's a set of AirPods. Yes, we're going to give you both the left and the right, and that belongs now to Michael Kenner. Michael Kenner on the list uh, today is our door prize winner. Another reason to participate next Thursday, there'll be another door prize. Uh, so grateful for the staff and everyone who worked so hard to bring these fielding forward meetings uh, together. We'll look forward to being back in person next year. Uh, here's some of the folks that we want to say thank you to and their names and their logos are presented here on the screen. Hope you have a great day. Hope you have a great weekend. We'll look forward to seeing you next Thursday. For Farm Credit Illinois, I'm Jeff Nally.